Before we dive into some of your recommendations, I just have to ask David something and everyone can weigh in. In our prep call, you were talking about how younger people perceive Wall Street, which is something we don't always think about. So even though they may be understanding the importance of of investing, you think there are a bunch of myths that they need to bust? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, one of the things you know, I've I've only worked really in finance, but I have to say, the nicest people that I know actually work in finance. Uh, I have a young team of about thirty people around the world. They are all really nice, interesting, hardworking, very honest, very empathetic people. They just like numbers. Um, they like expressing themselves. They they find it interesting. But I think that when you look at how Hollywood portrays Wall Street, it's all about, you know, it's sort of the Wolf of Wall Street idea. It's all about greed. And I, to be honest, I just don't see that. That's, not, you know, maybe I was left out of the party the whole way through my career. But, <laughs> you but didn't I think, know Leonardo DiCaprio. It's but, on you. But the problem is I know that if you did a movie about the way Wall Street actually is, it would be so boring. <laughs> uh, so nobody, nobody does that. But I think particularly for younger people who are thinking, you know, maybe I'll go into medicine or maybe I'll go into law. You know, think about finance. There's nothing wrong with it. You're, you're helping people grow money. Over time, you're helping industries grow. You'll meet lots of interesting people who are and nice people who are just interested in the same stuff. So I, I think I think Wall Street gets a very bad rap from the media in general and from from TV uh, from movies. And I think um, I think people should just take a second look at the culture of Wall Street because I think it's a lot better than people think. Before we start discussing investment ideas, Liz and Catherine, would you agree? Do you think that this is something that perhaps needs to be changed? I mean, I think that's a historical look. I mean, I'm a quant, and the way that I think about it is quants are taking over. <laughs> um, and we're sort of in a world where everything is about changing the footprint of finance and using new tools. So I really think that is sort of an artifact of the past, and hopefully people will start to see that. I mean, I know I see that in the young people that I work with, that so many of them are data scientists. Yeah programmers and people who are excited about sort of revolutionizing and changing the so, financial so industry. A little bit more nerdy and less partying. Yeah. yeah. Oh, definitely. <laughs> but you know what? They could not sell the movie. For some reason, they couldn't get a studio to sign on to <laughs> that, to the movie. quant uh, yeah. data scientist. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I completely agree. And thank you for making finance look better than I think it has for a while. It's just the, the generations that are coming into the workforce right now, it's not quite as glamorous or as cool to go on to Wall Street. It used to be really cool. That used to be the job that everybody really wanted. And now uh, the younger generations want jobs in tech. I mean, I got into this industry because I liked math and I liked business. And it was an easy way to meld both of them. And you find a lot of people that like those similar things in the industry. And when you just look around as you move through your career in finance, it's, you know, we all, we all sort of hope that we have a career that continues to challenge us and we can learn every day. I think every single one of us on the stage can agree. We get it wrong often enough that I am challenged constantly and we have to learn constantly and the market changes so much and the economy changes that there is no shortage of new stuff to find out in this industry. We're going to discuss the volatility and the challenges, but before we get to this, Liz, I'm going to start with you. Just from your vantage point, the younger investor, are there certain asset classes you believe they find more attractive? Well, so we talk about the younger investor as if there's some sort of you know different type of animal that looks at the world so differently than, than the older investor, I guess you could put it that way. There are asset classes that they are maybe more interested in because they're more familiar. So they're actually not that much different than an investor from 20 years ago. It's just that 20 years ago, the market looked different and technology wasn't such a big part of it. So what they're familiar with and what they're close to and what they understand are different sectors than maybe what we did when we just came out of college. We have this, it's an ETF called the SoFi Social 50, and it's just the 50 most widely held stocks on our platform. And as a representation, our investors, 63% of our investors are between the ages of 20 and 40, so definitely a younger crowd. 
that ETF still has the stuff that you'd expect in it. And actually, the biggest sector is consumer discretionary. It's not even tech, a lot of which has to do with Amazon. But still, it's the big names that you would expect. And then the stuff that maybe is more interesting is the what I would call the woke names or the cool factor names, right? There's cannabis in there. There's meme stocks. Uh, and then the disruptors. And they're definitely more risky on that side maybe than an older investor. David Kelly, you're chief global strategist. Are you finding that younger investors are also interested in investing beyond the U.S. tech names? To, to some extent, yes. I mean, I think when I think about younger investors, they're first of all, they're much more educated than their parents' generation, which I think is, is part of it. And also the ability to buy a stock or buy a cryptocurrency or invest in different things. It's much, it's much more e easy for them technologically to, to access that. Having said that, uh, we still see in, in investors overall just a huge um, fear about the rest of the world. I, you know, I, I, don't want, I think that younger investors probably are less scared of the rest of the world than, than older investors. But in general, in America, if we hear about the rest of the world, it's either tanks or tear gas or both. That's it. Mm. We get fed a constant barrage of negative news about the rest of the world. And as we're told, it is a scary place. So I think the younger investors, like investors in general, are probably too US centric. Mm -hmm. Catherine Kaminsky, you are the quant, the one, as you say, you believe you're taking over the world. Uh, do you find that younger investors perhaps trust those algorithms more than, say, an older investor because they grew up more tech savvy? Definitely. And I think the biggest excitement right now is there's so much information out there. There's so much easy access to it. And all you have to do is get the right tools to actually manage that opportunity set. My personal view also is that we're in an environment with a lot of obstacles, which are going to be opportunities, particularly from a macro perspective. And so that's interesting because now you have a lot more people thinking about things differently. And the greatest part about the younger investor is the younger investor has a shorter time window. So they are probably going to be able to adapt to this new changing environment in ways that we're not going to think about. So maybe they can actually innovate and find opportunities where most of us are kind of stuck thinking about the 60-40, I'd say, going forward. Let's talk about, uh, dive deeper into the asset classes. I don't know if, Liz, you and I had this conversation, but we were hearing that younger investors tended to hold fewer financials, hold fewer industrials. You were talking about the cool companies. Is that really something that you're seeing? And what do you recommend to them? Because yeah. cool can be dangerous. Yeah, well, it, yeah, it tends to fall in a higher beta asset class. So the, I think, and this is my personal opinion, this is a theory. I don't know if this is exactly true. but. If you think about a younger investor, the only recession that they may have lived through so far is 2007, 2008. And that completely vilified traditional financials. So then they finally are building wealth, and they've got money to invest, and they're putting it in their brokerage accounts, and they're excited about trading. One of the last things that they're going to look at is, oh, I want to buy these big banks, right? So when you look at what they're holding, they own the stuff that's headline makers except for some of those big banks. Now, they do actually own Berkshire Hathaway because Warren Buffett is still a legend. But the big banks are not something that they're super interested in. Some of the uh, conversations and some of the things that I try to message to a younger investor is that just because your time horizon is really long and just because you understand these particular stocks better, doesn't mean that they're going to produce the returns that you need them to, and doesn't mean that the risk tolerance is right for you. So diversification is still important. And some of the, the idea behind diversification, which was a, a phrase coined a few years ago, is that you're going to have stuff in the portfolio that isn't working at some given moment. That's what's supposed to happen. It's not all supposed to work at the same time. And you're probably going to have some stuff in the portfolio that you're not interested in, or that you don't really understand why you need to own. But that is the purpose of making sure that it acts the way it should in different market environments. So it's really important to still keep that in mind. That's a very good point, one that applies to investors of all ages. David, I'm going to ask you to weigh in on that as well. And that is the appetite for everybody, especially in this market, to understand that failures are part of the process. And again, that idea of patience through these downturns. Well, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's one of the things people need to, need to realize is it's not about making 
um, you know, a very fast, fast buck here. And I think, I think the other thing, you know, and with all due respect to, to Quans, Catherine, I mean, I think that I think it's very important to also look at the fundamentals because I think one of the problems that I think a lot of younger investors get into is they get blinded by the algorithms. I mean, you know, what could be more cool sounding than cryptocurrency? Oh, it's cryptic. How's anybody going to understand it? And it's beautiful. It's a beautifully built empty box because there's actually nothing in there. Um, I mean, it's the equivalent of the, of the wild cat, cat banks of the, of the, the 19th century, but I suppose if I talk to the average uh, millennial or Gen X, uh, Gen Z, or they probably wouldn't know what the wildcat banks of the 19th century were. But, uh, but the, the problem is sometimes people get so enthused about the technology they forget to ask price over earnings, or are there any earnings, or will there ever be any earnings, or can this company generate a fence around their earnings so they can make money over time? And it's very important to ask those fundamental questions. One of the things, you know, one of the points I would so want to make to young investors is, do you really think that this is the best thing, the thing you're very best at, investing? Okay, that's fine. If that's what you do, good. Go off and be a hedge fund manager or a portfolio manager, great. But if you have something else, some other passion in your life, work on that and allow the markets just to grow your money. Don't try and beat the market because there's smarter minds in Wall Street who are just going to eat you up. If you just go after what you think is cool or what is most alluring or makes the front of whatever um, you know, web page you, you look at. I, I think people just need to not get blinded by the concept and really look at what's it all worth. Mm -hmm. And for Catherine Kaminsky, it may not just be a smarter mind, but a smarter algorithm. Right now is so much volatility. Many people think, oh, the quants are having a field day with this. Are you having fun? Oh, yeah. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> we love volatility. Volatility means that so much is happening in the world. And I think what's interesting right now is that you're in an environment where there's massive shifts and correlations between asset classes, and there's also just completely different opportunities than what you see in the data. But what's nice is that if you think about history, we like to say history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. So there's actually a lot of similarities in the way that people behave throughout the course of history that is very similar today with just different circumstances. So I think that's interesting to me that there's so many parallels now to what we've seen in the past, and the new investor was the old investor before. Mm -hmm. so. Now, all three of you, well, especially uh, David and Liz, you have to prognosticate. You're always looking forward. You're looking ahead. You have to make recommendations. So Liz, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit because we promised that we were going to discuss the risks and the opportunities. So let's talk about the volatility. Do you think we are at the low or getting very close to it? Oh, gosh. Um, I love, hate that question. So first of all, I won't call lows because it's a really easy way to be wrong. It, what we're doing right now, I think, is approaching the June low. So the intraday June low is somewhere around 3640 on the S&P. The closing low is 3666, which is just an ominous number as it is, and I'd like to get rid of that. But we're approaching that, OK? And we're approaching it at a time when investors are trying to decide, do we deserve to be down a recessionary amount in the market. Now, then you would ask, what's a recessionary amount? Peak to trough during a recession, usually the market is down 35 to 45%. That's a, a very broad average, but average. We've only made it down 24% so far in this cycle. So from the peak on January 3rd to that low on June 16th, that was about a 24% decline. That makes sense if there's no recession. A drawdown without a recession is usually somewhere between 25 and 30 percent, okay? So we're going to approach those June lows, I think. This is my opinion. I think we approach those June lows, and then the market tries to decide, do we deserve to be down more than 30 percent? And what will happen with the algos, and Catherine can probably tell you this better, is that we'll get there and either blow through them and go down another 5 to 10 percent pretty quickly, and then maybe we form a bottom, or we bounce off of that and kind of stay in this range. I would prefer, frankly, that we flush this out quickly, get it out of the system, and then find that more credible bottom, which is something that technicians will tell you. There's different measures of that. What does the bottom actually look like? We never really hit those triggers in June when we saw those lows. So if we hit those bottom triggers um, where you're really oversold and extended to the downside, I'd like to see that happen sooner rather than later. I'm going to have to put the two of you on the spot as well. So, Catherine, again, the algos love trying to pinpoint when this happens. So your thoughts as well. So we tend to think that people are very complacent 
and people tend to be unfortunately hopeful before they see the real reality of what's going on. And that's exactly what we've seen this year. Um, we're still seeing inflation at a high level compared to interest rates, and we don't think that the problems are solved. And I think what that means is that we need to get to a point where those problems are at least somewhat solved before we stop seeing more negative signals in equities. And I also believe this is not an equity story. The story is about rising rates, and it's about inflation. So once we solve that, then we can solve the equity story. David, Kelly, I want to put you on the spot. It's so timely because there is a lot of disagreement on the latest Fed hike, mm -hmm. if it was enough, and added to the, to the issue and the question, how much longer should the rates keep going up and for how long? Yeah, I think, you know, I talk a lot about lessons from history. This is a case where you shouldn't take a lesson from history. Uh, I thought it was really interesting that at Jackson Hole, um, Jerome Powell took, he only spoke for eight minutes, but he managed to quote uh, Paul Volcker, uh, Alan Greenspan, and Ben Bernanke all in that period of time. And these were three giants of the economics profession. But he said, well, if you look at history, this is what happens when you have inflation and inflation expectations. I'm thinking this is a 50-year-old playbook. The world's changed a lot. And I think this is particularly important when it comes to inflation. Because what we actually have seen is headline inflation has rolled over. It peaked um, in June. Um, it has come down some since then. We were at 9.1%. In June, we're down about 8.3% right now. It's going to fall further because we know the commodities are going to roll over. Uh, there is a problem, you know, wage growth will stay sticky for, oh, will stay strong for a while. And I don't really mind that. That's, uh, you know, it's about time work has got to raise. Um, but if you look at other things, shelter, inflation, it, it's pushing up core inflation, but it's mostly nebulous because nobody pays, pays owner's equivalent rent. Anyway, the point is, it is fading. I mean, even if you look at the Fed's own forecast, they're talking about inflation starting with a two-handle at the end of the fourth quarter of next year and another two-handle the fourth quarter of the following year. It took us eight years to get down from 10% to 4% on the unemployment rate. Nobody thought that you know, there was anything particularly wrong with that because it came down slowly. Inflation's going to come down slowly anyway. There is no point in tipping the economy into recession to fight a battle you're going to win anyway. I mean, this is not the inflation dragon of the 1970s. This is, this is a, a wimpy descendant of that beast. You, know, you nick it in the, in, in the foot, it's going to bleed out. And, the, and the inflation is going to decline I just think the, the Fed just feels like they're getting blamed. Oh, we've got to look tough against inflation because everybody's blaming us. It wasn't them. It was, it was Trump and Biden and, and Ukraine and COVID, and that's what did it. It wasn't the Fed. I, I have a real problem with the Fed keeping rates too low for too long, but it wasn't their fault, and they don't need to be so aggressive in trying to fix it. But with, with regard to, and I know I'm talking along here, but just no, one, one other thing. <laughs> with regard to when the market hits a bottom, you know, I'm a very boring poker player. Because I, you know, I sort of sit at a table and I only play a hand that I know I've got a good chance of winning, and, and so you know, fold, 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 <laughs> and and, and, I, and I've, got, I've got, I've got, I've got, yeah, no, I've got, I've got to repress that, admittedly, <laughs> but I try desperately. But but the point is, people, investors, don't need to play the game of picking the bottom. In order to pick the bottom, if you're an investor, you've got to do two things. You've got to know when to get out and when to get in. That's two really difficult decisions you've got to get right to get this thing right. The right thing to think about is, again, getting back to the inflation issue, if I'm right, and if three or four years from now we're looking at a slow growth, low inflation economy with the Federal Reserve having to uh, once again reverse course and cut rates, a low interest rate environment will support a lot of long duration assets. And so what I think you need to do is just look at valuations today, figure out what's going to survive whatever recession we may or may not have, and probably will have, but what's going to survive that and what looks like good value and what will look like good value a few years from now just you know, slightly overweight that stuff, stay diversified and, and cool it, rather than trying to just time all of this. I have to ask, what are the odds that you think we are going to have a recession? I'd call it about a, I think by the end of next year, it's, a, it's about a 60-40 shot. I mean, I've got a friend of mine, had another, all, all the people in my team are younger than me. I mean, I'm, I'm old enough to be their father. I'm possibly old enough to be the <laughs> grandfather at this stage in some cases. But, but you know, one, one of them, David Leibovitz, was saying, it's kind of like you're walking around the edge of a pool. Well, I'd say it's like walking around the edge of a pool with a, a boisterous kids' party going on. One bump, and we're in, we're in recession. It, 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 we, we are being protected a little bit right now by this excess demand for labor, which was, is a relic of the pandemic and demographics and so forth. I don't know how real that is. I don't know how long that's going to last. But everything else in the economy is slowing. 
and dragging on the economy. So I do think the economy is very vulnerable to recession in the next year. So if you fall in that pool, there's not necessarily a unicorn floaty there to, you can jump on. No, but, but, that's, but that's actually important because there won't be a fiscal one. Mm -hmm. Because I think that in November, the Republicans will very likely take at least the House. And that means no fiscal stimulus between now and the 20, 2024 election. So if the economy does fall into recession, who are you going to call? Yeah. It's got to be the Fed. And while the Fed now says, oh, it's all about inflation, we've got to get inflation down, you know, that wasn't what they were saying a year ago. And it probably won't be what they're saying a year from now. And so I think while the Fed protests that they will be as tough as nails on inflation, I think a year from now, they're actually going to be forced into doing something about a weakening economy or, or an actual recession. So Liz Young, as head of investment strategy, this is the beast that's over your shoulder that you're looking at when you make your decisions. What are your odds you believe we're going to have a recession? Well, there's a lot of beasts back there. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I, I actually like to use a tornado analogy. I'm from Wisconsin. We had tornadoes there. So I think in, the, in these terms, when there was a tornado watch, it meant that the conditions were present for a tornado to form. When there was a tornado warning, it meant that one had been spotted somewhere in the vicinity. I think we're at warning. A recession has been spotted, so we had our two consecutive quarters of negative growth, but that one doesn't count because it didn't reset the business cycle. It didn't shake everything out. Inflation still went up after that technically ended. And I do think that we're going to get positive GDP growth in the third quarter. So anybody that's looking at it from that definition is going to say, oh, okay, there's no recession. Uh, but we are in warning for 2023. I think the real question now is, how deep and how long will it be and how many sectors of the economy will it affect? So we saw yesterday from the Fed their summary of economic projections. Uh, and this, unfortunately, you know, I was, I was reasonably bullish on the way into yesterday, but I had a list of thesis busters. And those thesis busters were if the economic projections came out with higher inflation, higher Fed funds, lower growth, and higher unemployment, my thesis is busted, okay? Which is exactly what happened. And the odds of recession, in my opinion now, are higher. When they came out with the higher rate of unemployment, that was something that I think the market had a lot of trouble digesting because it's part of their dual mandate. It's 50% of their mandate is to maintain full employment. So it's difficult for us to look at that and say, OK, they're going to fight inflation, but they're OK with almost breaking the labor market. And that's going to be a really delicate balance. The 40% chance that we don't go into a recession is that the labor market doesn't completely fall apart. Mm. Catherine. Well, I think from my side, we're more of a technical signals mm -hmm. uh, perspective. And what you've seen this year is more negative signals, recessionary signals since the summer, uh, particularly in the equity sector. But we've also started to see that in the commodity sector as demand has dissipated some. So I think. For us, we may be kind of the ones who are always looking for that recession and, and always looking for that pattern. But it definitely is a pattern that we see in the data right now. And so from our perspective, maybe the chance is a little higher, perhaps 70-30, uh, than what David was suggesting. Yeah. I, th I think we have to recognize that every recession, is, it's kind of like at the start of Anna Karenina, the first line is that every happy family is the same, and every unhappy family is unhappy in its own unique way. And every recession is kind of unique. And what's really unique about this business cycle is that extraordinary excess demand for labor. Yeah. And we just don't know what 11 million job openings mean. Mm -hmm. Because you know, it's one thing actually to, you know, it takes a certain amount of effort to hire somebody to post a job opening today, you just post it. Did you take it down? Well, you know, in your list of things to do today, did I take down the job opening? Oh, no. <laughs> Who cares? Yeah. Uh, and, and so we don't know what that is that you know is that real demand or is some of it fake demand? Is it going to evaporate? That's what we don't know, and that's really what I think the Federal Reserve ought to be thinking a lot about. But again, I think they should be taking it easy here because they're 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 charging forward in tightening, really in a very foggy environment. May I just give a shout out that I think it's amazing that we have referenced in this conversation Wolf of Wall Street and Anna Karenina. <laughs> That's just what you are attending here. All right, so strategy looking forward. We're approaching our, our, our last six minutes of, of this panel. So you've all given a greater odds of recession, 60 to 70 percent. So Liz, in your role of strategy, what is your recommendation specifically what are you even seeing or recommending that people hold in cash right now for the moment that things get uglier, yeah. that there are the opportunities? Yeah. Uh, so when I talk about strategy and asset allocation, it's, it's long only. So the most bearish I'll ever get is to tell people to be in cash more than usual. Um, I imagine that there are a decent amount of people who are 
in more than usual cash positions right now. If you just look at the equity outflows and ETFs over the last few weeks, with the exception of this week, there have been a lot of outflows of equity. So I imagine that people do have a larger than usual cash position. So then it's a question of do you deploy it, when do you deploy it, and where do you deploy it? In this environment, and remember, even if we do go into a recession in 2023, the market bottoms first. The market bottoms first, then the economy bottoms. So if the recession happens in 2023, the bottom in the market likely happens in 2022, frankly, or early 2023. So this is a period where we do still have to go through this digestion process. We have to wait for inflation to come down, but that means that we could kind of grind lower for a while, in which case that's a good opportunity to drip your money in, take those cash positions and start dripping it back in. Where would you do that? This is to David's point about fundamentals. How much are you willing to pay for growth? If you look at classic growth sectors like discretionary and tech, I still think they're pretty expensive. Tech is at 20 times forward PE. Discretionary is at 24 and a half, I think, forward PE. Look at sectors like communications or healthcare. Those are trading at somewhere like 14, 15 and a half times PE, lower than the broader S&P. And then you can look at, I would look at cyclical sectors that are also trading below, things like financials. I know if you're a millennial or a Gen Zer, you don't like those, but give it a shot. Financials, uh, industrials, some of the places where you'd get more value, more bang for your buck. Catherine, when ask you next, you're watching the signals again. So this has been a fantastic year for momentum trading and for any of the themes that you see cross assets. What we've seen is some of the strongest short signals in fixed income since 1994. Um, someone asked me a great question the other day. They said, how come bonds have so much volatility? And I said, well, don't you know, risky assets have downside volatility. You've just never seen it before. Um, so that's sort of the way to think about it is bonds have just been in a very positive cyclical environment for a long time. So people are going to have to watch out for fixed income exposure, both in individual assets, but also in assets that have exposure to fixed income, like growth companies and tech, where as we see higher rates, which could possibly go higher than we like, even if it's warranted or not, um, that's gonna create a lot of opportunities to think about how that affects your investments. Secondly, the commodity sector has been at the core of everything that's going on. That means that you have to think about what's going on in the raw materials to actually understand how that's going to impact the fundamentals of individual businesses and sectors. So people are paying a lot more attention to commodities. They're also paying a lot more attention to duration exposure recently, and that's something that I think is going to continue going forward. I'm going to give you each one minute. We're down to our last three minutes about advice looking forward. Again, so many factors, war, supply chain challenges, a volatile market, the economy that is showing signs of weakness. So David, you first, your advice to investors right now. Well, I think the, I think the most important advice is, is take a long-term view. You know, Lift up your head, look out a few years at least. Don't try and time this. Uh, but also, you know, look around the world, uh, you know, particularly in Europe, actually. I mean, Europe, and nobody says a nice word about Europe, and it certainly is you know, threatened by recession, probably in recession at this stage, uh, Ukraine war, just a lot of problems. But, and the euro is extremely low, as is the British pound. But there, there's a possibility, you know, there aren't just black swans in the world, there are actually white swans too. And if you had some sort of ceasefire in Ukraine, European stocks will just take off. If you had a pivot from the Federal Reserve, then the dollar, which is way too high, could begin to come down. And the main major beneficiary of that would be the euro. So I think that's a place to perhaps put an extra dollar. But the most important thing is just look at valuations, take a long-term view, do not try and play the ups and downs of this market unless you truly think you're smarter than the, than the average person who spends every day uh, on Wall Street doing this. Liz. Yeah, I think as investors, we have the benefit today of so much more information at our fingertips, but that's a blessing and a curse. And it's a curse in the sense that every time we get a new piece of information, we're tricked into thinking that we're supposed to do something about it. And I would urge people, especially in this environment, even though it's so tempting to chase that around and it's so tempting to do some day trading on the margins, even just look at what happened yesterday, the swings after 2 p.m. Eastern time, between 2 and 4 p.m. Eastern time, there was no way anybody was really going to catch that and get it right. So it's, it's not going to behoove you to chase those around. And I would resist the urge uh, to act on any new piece of information and really try to give yourself, I would call it almost a three-week rule. When you want to make a big move, give yourself a few weeks to really sit back and think, is this how I want to change everything? And the answer is 
probably know at the end of that period. All right. Well, with the markets, though, three weeks feels like an eternity, but it does. I am going to it employ does. that. Okay. All right, Catherine. I think I'd have to agree with Liz and that I'd say that emotions are very high right now. And that's why, for example, us systematic investors, we have a plan and we follow that plan. So I think it's important for investors to also have a plan and try not to react to short term moves, because, as you know, they can change within the same day these days. Thank you so much. I wish we had another hour to discuss with you. I would like to thank our panelists, Catherine Kaminsky of Alpha Simplex, JP Morgan's David Kelly, and Liz Young from SoFi. Thank you so much. Thank for being you. With us.